Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review Part 8, and this is Session 29. So let's just keep reading this. John MacArthur, whose book, The Gospel According to Jesus, and by the way, I, I, I stopped to say the gospel according to Jesus was the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of the grace of God. When John MacArthur presents the gospel, guess what he presents? The gospel of the grace of God. John MacArthur preaches the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And yet he titled his book, The Gospel According to Jesus. Unbelievable. All right, so, the Gospel according to Jesus lays out the case for Lordship salvation, summarizes the teaching this way. The Gospel call to faith presupposes, wow, it presupposes that sinners must repent of their sin. Well, wait a minute. Is that something Jesus did or something we're doing? I'm going to tell you again. If you think you can do anything to add to what he did, that's not salvation. That is a mistake. It's a clever mistake. Why in the world? You know what? This looks so good on the outside because who among us doesn't want say people to act like Jesus is Lord. Of course we do. I'm not fighting against that. I'm just saying you can't make that a necessary requirement for salvation. The gospel call to faith presupposes that sinners must repent of their sin and yield to Christ's authority. That's a work. And it's not by works. It's by grace. And it's not by both. Because if it's by works, it's no longer by grace. So, uh, let's see. Um, he's going to continue. In other words, a sinner who refuses to repent is not saved. So if a sinner refuses to do something... Okay, he's not saved, for he cannot cling to his sin and his Savior at the same time. Well, now see, that raises another question for me. If you cannot cling to your sin and your Savior at the same time, then I have a question for you. Do Christians sin? So where do you draw the line? What do you mean he cannot cling to his sin? What does that mean? If it's salvation, I would think you'd want to define these terms pretty precisely, wouldn't you? If he cannot cling to his sin, what does that mean? He can't like his sin? Well, nobody does sin because they don't like it. It's because they do like it. What does he mean, cling to his sin? He can't cling to his sin and the Savior at the same time. See, I don't. I, that's, that seems... Uh, that seems like a way to kind of phrase his argument without being precise about it. And, by, and so clinging to sin, what, what do you think that means? Anybody got an idea? What is clinging to sin? Okay, and so here's my question. That's a good answer. It's repetitious sin. So here's my answer. How many times can you do it before all of a sudden you're not saved? What's the, what, where's the line? Can you, can you sin one? He's going to come along and say, oh, Christians do sin. So the question is, how much can you sin before suddenly you're not saved? That's interesting. I'd like to get a chapter and verse on it. But, okay, just raising the question here. And a sinner who rejects Christ's authority in his life does not have saving faith. For true faith encompasses a surrender to God. Thus, the gospel requires more than making an intellectual decision or mouthing a prayer. Well, I, I would agree that there is no magic in words. You cannot just say, Jesus, save me, 
And if you don't understand what that's about, that, that statement has no meaning to it. I get that. But he's saying it requires more than an intellectual decision. Well, I'm going to tell you what. Trusting what Jesus did, folks, is an intellectual decision. And that's it. You're either believing it and trusting in that, or you're trusting in something else. Or you're trusting in nothing at all. <clears throat> Thus, the gospel requires more than making an intellectual decision or mouthing a prayer. The gospel message is a call to discipleship. And this is where I say he is confusing the call to salvation with the call for service. Those are two separate issues. You cannot serve until after you are saved. So how can service be a requirement for salvation? like when I was a kid, first time I went into Sears, I was going to buy a washing machine. I hadn't been married very long. And I told the guy, I said, I want to, I want to buy the washing machine, and I want to buy it on credit. And he said, well, do you have credit? And I said, no, sir. And he said, well, to get credit, you have to have credit. I said, but if you don't have credit, and you need credit to get credit, how do you get credit? But I understood what he was saying, don't you? We want, we want to see a track record of what you've done before in order to extend you credit. But if you've never had a track record, somebody has to suspend that. Right? Were you going to say something, Linda? Right? Right? Okay. Yeah, right. Okay, so here's the last one. The sheep will follow their shepherd in submissive obedience. Is that always true? Are there any disobedient servants in the Bible? There's a lot of wayward sheep. See, this is, you understand the danger in this? Here's a guy, look, this is the kind of thing that makes people say, you know what, when their life kind of runs off the rails, you know what they do? They go, I must not be saved. So you know what they do? They, I remember when I was pastoring in Glen Rose, there was a Baptist church there in Glen Rose, and the guy who was pastoring it was a Calvinist. This is real close to Calvinism. John MacArthur may be a Calvinist for all I know. I don't know for sure. But this is real close to Calvinism. If the, the sheep will follow the shepherd in submissive obedience. That, that's almost like if you're saved, you don't have any choice. This is what you'll do. And if you don't do it, then guess what? You didn't really get saved. This man, this man evidently look, looked at that doctrine and you know what he decided? He must not be saved. Calvinism's a, a tricky thing because are you part of the elect? I mean, if God elected you, how do you know you got elected? How do you know it's just not you pretending that you got saved? If God didn't elect you, you can't get saved no matter what. That's the Calvinist belief. So you know what? He's looking at his life and he's going, I must not be saved. So he gets up in the pulpit one Sunday morning and he goes, I got saved this week. And I need someone to baptize me. And if you don't want me to be your pastor, then I understand. But you need to decide what you want to do. So they said, oh no, we still want you to be our pastor and we'll baptize you. I'm thinking, all right, now just think about that. If you really and truly just now got saved, is that the person you want leading the group? See, that would be a babe in Christ, wouldn't it? Paul has a scripture over in Corinthians where he talks about lay hands on no man suddenly. He's not talking about don't go up and grab them. He's talking about 
Don't put them into a position of leadership until they have matured and demonstrated that maturity. Now look, here's what I believe. I believe the guy was already saved. But his screwball doctrine kept him from being sure of that. And you know what? That won't be the last time in his life that something will happen and he'll wonder, am I really saved? Because it's going to all be based on what he does, not on what Christ has done. Do you understand the difference in that? Big difference. It is not based on how faithful you are. Your salvation rests in how faithful he was. It is. Yeah, because, uh, uh, for instance, if you decide you can't keep that, which nobody can, you might just give up. So well, exactly right. And do you know what you have then? Then you have people throwing in the towel, and they're going, I tried that Christianity stuff, it doesn't work. And you have people being mad at God. I mean, there's all kinds of terrible things that happen because of these errors. Well, let me, let me take you right on. Advocates of Lordship Salvation point to Jesus' repeated warnings to the religious hypocrites of His day as proof that simply agreeing to spiritual facts does not save a person. There must be a heart change. Well, wait a minute. That almost sounds like we're the one changing our heart. I thought God was the one that did that. There must be a heart change. Well, look. Advocates of Lordship Salvation point to Jesus' repeated warnings to the religious hypocrites of His day. What scriptures do you reckon they're in to try to get their doctrine here? They're over in the Gospels. They're talking about during the earthly ministry of Jesus. And I'll guarantee you, because we're going to see it, they don't understand the scriptures they're reading over there. So... Jesus emphasized the high cost of discipleship. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought we were talking about salvation. The high cost of discipleship. Discipleship is not the same thing as salvation. Those are two separate issues. You know, Linda mentioned the job thing a while ago. Salvation is like when you get hired. You're in. But until you show up to work on that first day, you're not actually going to work, are you? Well, I'm just saying. Jesus emphasized the high cost. This is their words. Whoever, and now he's quoting Luke 14. Isn't this great? Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Jesus is not talking about, unless you carry your cross and follow me, you cannot be saved. You cannot be my disciple. And that is a separate issue. And I'll show you that. In fact, I'm going to show you the scripture that tells you that. Because what John MacArthur and other Lordship Salvation preachers are saying, that if you really are saved, you will do these things, I'm going to show you the scripture that says that there were people who were saved and they did not do those things because those two are two separate issues. And, he quotes, those of you who do not give up everything you, 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 everything you have cannot be my disciples. That's Luke 14, 32. Do you remember the rich young ruler came to Jesus Jesus said, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And he went away sorrowfully for he had great possessions. You know what John MacArthur would say about him? See, he couldn't be... Now, there, what he doesn't understand is there's two issues going on there, just like there is in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. There's two separate issues going on there. And he doesn't understand that. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> sorry, I'm distracted. All right, so... He's saying, what was he saying? I have no idea now. It went completely out of my head. The rich young ruler, you know what? When Jesus says, sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and come and follow me. And then he quotes this verse, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. 
Do you know anybody that gave up everything they have in order to be saved? Do you know one person in the world who did that? Then I guess none of us are saved. Because John MacArthur didn't do it. Neither did I. Neither did you. Neither did anyone else that we know. Nobody gave away all their stuff so they could follow Jesus. And do you know why? Well, by the way, did Jesus really say that? Well, he did. By the way, did anybody do that? Sure they did. You know what Peter said? We have forsaken all and followed thee. But that was something very specific for Israel back there. So if, you're, if you think that's for you today, how do you get out of that? you got to find a way to get out of it because you're claiming to be saved, but you didn't give away all your stuff. You didn't give up everything you have. From your, from your heart, your mind. Yeah, you have to spiritualize it. You have to go, well... I'm willing to get... But did Jesus ever say it that way? No. See, isn't that convenient how we do that? I mean, that's just wild to me. All right, let's keep rolling here. But I, I want to talk to you for a moment about the Sermon on the Mount so that you understand what that is. The Sermon on the Mount is the corrective doctrine that Jesus was giving to the members of his little flock. How do you become part of the little flock? How do you do that? You believed in Him, didn't you? Right. That made you part of the little flock. That means you're already saved. So what He's doing to them is He's giving them the corrective doctrine that will enable them to disassociate themselves from the apostate element in Israel understand their doctrine is erroneous, and not be deceived by it. He's teaching them the truth. Now, folks, that's kind of what I'm doing with us today. I am showing us this so that we do not get deceived by this doctrine. And so, but for a Jew, it was real important to disassociate himself from, from the apostate element. And here's what I'm going to say to you. Easy believism, as they call it, is not the issue here in the Sermon on the Mount. The ones that are being talked to in the Sermon on the Mount are ones who have already believed that Jesus is the Christ and they're part of the little flock. So here's, here's what he's going to say about this. Uh, let's see, in the same passage, Jesus speaks of counting the cost. Elsewhere, he stresses total commitment. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. But did he say they weren't saved? Now, by the way, he's not using the King James here. I don't know if you noticed that in the last one that we, I just quoted what they had. He's not using the King James, which means he does not understand that issue either. But when he said, but these are the verses he's using, so I'm just going to talk to you out of those verses. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit to be saved. No, fit for what? Service. That's a different issue. Let me ask you this. You know what he said, what he's talking about? Put your hand to the plow and you look back. What is the look back about? What is that? Does it mean you can't turn around and look behind you? You're not talking about physically looking behind you to look at the rows. What is he talking about? Yeah, looking back at the old stuff before you put your hand to the plow. In other words, before you went to work for God. It's kind of like looking back to say, oh, you know, I kind of miss all that. Well, let me ask you. Do you think any saved person ever thought that? So are they now not saved? See, he's going to say, no, you can't lose your salvation. He's just saying, anybody that thinks that never was really saved. Really? Now, that's a bit of a stretch, isn't it? All right. So let's keep going. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that eternal life is a narrow path found only by a few. Matthew 7. 
In contrast, easy believism seeks to broaden the path so that anyone who has a profession of faith can enter. Well, here's my question. A profession of faith in what? I have a profession of faith, and you know what my faith is in? The finished work of Jesus Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. That is what my faith is in. And that's the only thing I'm counting on saving me. That's it. Nothing else. When he says, so that anyone who has a profession of faith can enter, well, why in the world wouldn't they? I mean, that is just crazy talk. So, by the way, Matthew 7 is not talking about easy believism and difficult believism. You know what it's talking about? Matthew 7, when you go over and you look at that, is talking about two things. In, the, in that part of the Sermon on the Mount, there's two things. Look, I thought about how to draw this up here, and I thought today I should have drawn this up ahead of time. But look, here's, here's all these people, okay? I, I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm not going to be able to draw enough of them. Here's all these people that are in Israel. You know what? The number of people that believe the gospel of the kingdom, that believe that Jesus is the Christ, you know what? Out of all those people, there's only going to be a remnant. It is narrow. There's only going to be a remnant. But then he's also going to talk about, out of those people, there's going to be a remnant of a remnant who do what? who hold to his corrected doctrine faithfully until either the end of their life or until he shows up. So you have two things going on here. These are the folks who believe. These are the folks who confess. I'm going to show you this so that you will understand it. Because a Jew understood that issue right there. They did. So, let me keep reading here. Jesus says that every good tree bears good fruit. In contrast, easy believism says that a tree can still be good and bear nothing but bad fruit. Jesus says that many who say, Lord, Lord, will not enter into the kingdom. In contrast, easy believing teaches that saying, Lord, Lord, is good enough. That, that passage about there will be many that say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, and as I depart from me, I never knew you. He is not talking about easy believism versus anything else. What is he talking about? He's talking about you either believe that Jesus was the Messiah or you did not. That's all, he's, that's all that's about. He's not trying... And by the way, who is it saying, Lord, Lord? That someone is in there saying, Lord, Lord. And let me just fill in, because I didn't go over and run those references. But they're also casting out devils in Jesus' name. And they're doing many wonders. Now, is everybody with me right here? Do you, you get this? Here are some guys that are in there among the members of the little flock. And they're, they're, saying, they're crying out to the Lord. They're casting out devils in His name. And remember what the Lord says, I'll say to them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Is it because they were easy believism guys? Because i got to tell you, if there's a guy, I mean, can we, just, can we just be a Pentecostal church for a minute? Just for a minute. Mark's got the gift. Okay. So if, if there's a guy in our midst, and you know what he's doing? He's performing wonders in front of everybody. And he's casting out devils in the name of the Lord. You know what John MacArthur would do if he was standing there, if he was part of that group? He would say, you know what? He's demonstrating the fact that he has been saved. That's what he'd say because the guy evidently, 
is doing all the works. Right? Here's who these guys are. These are emissaries from the policy of evil that have been sent into this group of the little flock that are eventually going to work to deceive them and get them away from the true doctrine. But in order to gain everybody's trust, they're saying, Lord, Lord. Not because they really believe, but for deception purposes. And they're even, you know, this is so clever. Satan is even going to allow these charlatans to cast out devils. I mean, that's his devils. But he's going to allow them to cast out devils because if they did, who could ever accuse them of not being with the Lord? Do you see how clever that is? These are the ones that's being talked about here. Here's what. He doesn't understand that there is going to be an infiltration of the little flock by these deceivers who are coming in to do, and they're going to perform wonders. If you're a member of the little flock, how hard is it for you going to be to look at that? I mean, let's use Mark, for example, because I love throwing him under the bus. So here's Mark, and we're in our, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're in the, I was going to do a Pentecostal church, but let's just do it what it is. It's members of the little flock, because that's where he is over here. And, and Mark comes in, and he's talking about the Lord, and we see him casting out devils in the name of the Lord and doing many wonderful works in the name of the Lord. And then Eric goes over to Sandy after the service, and he says, I don't trust that Mark guy. And Sandy goes, wait a minute. That guy was casting out devils in, in Jesus' name. What do you mean you don't trust him? Eric goes, eh, something shifty about that guy. And then Clinton would go, man, did you see those wonders he was performing? You know what the truth of the matter is? If Eric thought that, he'd be reluctant to even say it to anybody. Why? Because all the evidence is there that they're the real deal. In fact, Clinton may go, well, Eric, I didn't see you casting out any devils. I think you're jealous. Clinton does think that, by the way. Okay. So, look, how many, how many Eric's would likely be in that assembly? Not many. The way to know, huh? And after that, not any. That's right. Because you know what? Here's, what? here's what they would do. They would look at all of that, and if all you're doing is judging by your eyes, you are going to be deceived. That's why the Lord gives them, and it's in the Scripture, a specific test that's, that demonstrates whether these guys are... Listen, here, because here's the difference. Rather, not are they easy believers... E easy believism or not, he said, there's sheep and there's wolves in sheep's clothing. That's not contrasting easy believism with discipleship. That's contrasting Satan's emissaries who are looking to deceive and corrupt the little flock. They're not they're not promoting easy believism. All they're doing is faking it with all of the wonders so that they will fool people and nobody can deny. So when that guy gets up and says, hey, the Lord has said this and he changes the doctrine on them a little bit, they'll all look at what he has been and what he has done and they'll go, well, I guess that's true. I guess that's true. That guy does a lot of things I can't do. Who am I to question him? Do you see the deceptive nature of that? So when, when John MacArthur says, Jesus said that many who say, Lord, Lord, will not enter the kingdom, he's not talking about because all they had was faith. That's a group of people who never had faith. They were just looking to infiltrate. They were exactly what Jesus said they are. Wolves in sheep's clothing. 
I wonder how come he didn't put that part in there when he was explaining this verse. You know why? Because it doesn't work with the truth he's trying to present. So he says, in contrast, easy believing teaches that Lord, Lord is good enough. I don't know anybody that teaches that. Those guys come in and when they go, Lord, Lord, I'm looking at that and I'm going, that ain't good enough because you're just doing it to deceive everybody. That's not, see, that's not really, that argument, that, that's, 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 that's a little bit dishonest is what that is. I think, it's, I, I think they really think that, but it, it's a dishonest argument. I know the deal went off, so we'll stop and we'll take a break. Now, we're almost done with this, but what I want to do now is just take you through a few of the verses that they're looking at to prove this, and then I'm going to end it with, I'm going to take you to the places in your Bible that show you there are people who believe, but they are not willing to commit. John MacArthur would say they're not really saved, but that is not what Jesus said about them. And that is not what the Bible says about them. Okay, we'll stop here and take a break.